Um, so Veterans Entertainment, um, I think uh, really what we're going to try to get in here is it's a little bit of storytelling. How did you get into what you're doing? Uh, what are the backstories? And um, I'll say, you know, a lot of where this interest for myself and why I was excited to moderate this comes from my conversations with Dallas initially and, you know, just being kind of a, a pathway from, you know, uh, being in the military to getting in film that was not very straightforward. Um, and I actually think the, uh, the, the benefit or the lessons learned from that story is you can really do anything you want if you want to do it. So um, that's what we'll kind of dive into. So real quick, I want to go around, uh, introduce who you are, who you're working with, um, and uh, then we can get into some questions. Is that me first? Yep, go for it. Hi, everyone. I'm Adrian Camille Lunson. Um, I was in the Navy, and I currently live and work in Hollywood. Um, I've worked for a number of studios, uh, Fox, uh, AMC Networks, um, behind the camera, and a number of projects in front of the camera as well. I've started my own company called Clio Studio, K-L-I-O Studio, to help with the actual creation and production of projects. I'm Dallas Burgess, uh, the Chief Production Officer for uh, Dream State Entertainment and Head of Production for Media Tech Ventures. Um, and I'm also a writer, director, and producer. Um, I uh, was in the Army for 10 years, a uh, paratrooper, uh, infantry type. Uh, and then pr after those 10 years, went into uh, private security contracting uh, for companies I can't mention. Um, and during that time per period, I uh, kind of fell into film and realized that uh, it was what I needed to make a, uh, an actual transition out of the military successful um, and sane, as sane as the entertainment industry can be. Um, and that's kind of what led me into Dream State. Uh, founded it with this Yahoo behind me here and, uh, and another veteran, uh, Joseph Seaton. Uh, and then we had Chip Jordans and Lacey Edgman. And yeah, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a wild ride so far. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Joy. I am an Austin-based actress and model, 11-year Army veteran. I spent four years active duty and four in the Guard. I was a Chinook pilot and a Black Hawk pilot, um, among other things. And this was not a path that I had in mind. I literally got pulled into it, into a commercial about five years ago for uh, Dick's Sporting Goods doing pull-ups. And I had such a great time that I messaged my friend who got me involved, and I said, how do I do more? And he said, let me get do you Do more pull-ups or do agent. more commercials? I was both. Okay. Yeah, all day. <laughs> Plus two more. And, and one. one for the summit on the and, Exactly. <laughs> so um, it's definitely been a, a journey. I've been in uh, multiple commercials, some films, and some other projects. It's just been a ride and I'm really excited to see where things are going from here. Oh, me? Yeah, you. Uh, my name's Ryan Normandon, uh, prior service Army. Um, spent about nine years and some change in the Army. Uh, paratrooper, just like this Yahoo over here. Um, got out, uh, I, wor I work with 911 TACMED, um, as well as a company called Empire Performance Built Firearms. And a couple years ago, I linked up with Danny Mason here. Um, and over the past couple of years, we've gotten together on some of our projects and gotten into writing and gotten into film. Um, and it's been an, a, a crazy adventure, a great adventure to say the least. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Cool. I'm Danny Mason. I am actually the, yeah, only citizen here. So I'm not actually a veteran. I, uh, I'm, I'm with you. Oh, you are. Yeah. Okay. So don't, uh, let, don't let the beard fool you. Don't let the beard. Yes. Yes. I've uh, learned that. Yeah. <laughs> just saying. Uh, I'm a producer with uh, Dream State Entertainment. Uh, I've been working with Dallas for about three and a half years, four, what Ryan just said, for the past three years. Uh, I've worked on productions for ABC, Netflix, um, Amazon Prime, so pretty much I play characters like Ryan and Dallas, so. So it's cultural appropriation, basically. <laughs> It's there you go. Sure. Let's just go with that. All right. Cool. Yes. Now that we've yes. got that. All right. We can check that box off. No, that, that's great. I, I think the the thing we you know when I'm listening to all it's it's these again very uh, atypical journeys into um, 
a type of job that I think a lot of people uh, would love to be in, but don't understand how difficult it is. Um, you know, you'd mentioned how you got started was you get roped into a, a commercial and thought that was interesting and something you wanted to do more of. It, why? What, what, was the, what was the hook? Was it was the production? Was it just how it was run? Camera, lights on? What is it? The, the whole thing. Um, I would say, you know, especially, and, and this is where the interesting segue is being a veteran, you know, um, you know, multiple combat tours, working with crews, working with, you know, brigade con combat teams in a combat environment, you know, when everything is synced and you have to be pl on your target plus or minus 30 seconds, you, you know, you get into that groove, you get into the zone. And when you're in a crew of seven that's in that, in combat, you feel that flow together. And there is very few things in the world that can come close to that. But I would say that being on set and being in a crew again and having that whole organism working together, it, it replicated some of that feeling that I had. And I know that after we leave service, a lot of veterans are struggling to find camaraderie. We're struggling to find that community that we got integrated into our lives. And you know, even in the moment, because with these projects, they're small, and when they're done, they're done. You go home. You know, you keep in touch with some people, but it's not this, the same thing where, you, you know, your brothers and sisters in arms for life kind of thing, because you've been through that. But, you know, when I saw the way that everyone was working together, the director, the cinematographer, the makeup, and, you know, the grips, and everybody, and it all came together, and then when I saw the final product, you know, and you got the tingles because they nailed it. It really is something career-wise that you know I, I could feel. I hope that makes sense. So no, it, it it does. Okay. So something I want to add to that. It's interesting. So my experience, so being an actor and a stuntman as well too. In my experience, I started working with a lot of veterans on roles and everything too. And when I share the same sentiment, which is basically it was an easy. I guess, aspect of being able to transition on it at the same time. But also, personally for me, because me and Ryan have worked on a couple pilots and stuff, and his points of frustration where I'm like, breathe, first off. <laughs> Don't punch somebody. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. It's true. <laughs> um, so, and for me, it's been really exciting. And for personally for me, that's when really kind of grow. And when you're talking about like brotherhood, you're absolutely right about that. And I think that's one of the best things I personally have gone out of that and working with veterans and everything on that part. It's a whole different aspect of brotherhood um, that comes with it and whatnot. So I just want to add to that. So, uh, While the military and the entertainment industry are different, they are different. It's a whole different life. Um, there are no other times in my life I have willingly stood out in the snow at four o'clock in the morning other than the entertainment industry and the military. <laughs> so <laughs> the early morning wake-ups, they're the same. The very long days, they're the same. Um, well, I was in the Navy, so being locked with the same 300 people for sometimes months on end, if you do get on a big production and it ends up being a three month long shoot, um, sometimes traveling all over the world, the same people, it's, it really gets to that family uh, point where you love and hate each other. That also happens. So, but at the same time, there's nothing quite as fulfilling that I found in any industry outside of the entertainment industry of you do something, you complete it, you get to show the world um, Whereas when we're in the military, we're doing important things. Like, you're doing things that end up on the news. You're doing things where you see the change in the world. Um, the entertainment industry, you do get to see some of the change in the world. Uh, documentary work, journalism work, even movies that change people. Um, it's, it's really fulfilling, but it is also incredibly competitive. Uh, so, and like you said, it's that, that end product is so important, because I think a lot of um, the challenge I've seen with veterans or anybody for that matter looking for jobs in today's, you know, as Gary Vaynerchuk calls it, the attention economy, the reality is what, what's the artifact that exists? It's why so many people in, you know, even not in the entertainment industry or 
you know, have all their own podcasts or have, you know, a documentary team following them around is because we, we crave that. We want there to be some endpoint that you can show. But I think from a project-based standpoint, when you're making, whether it's short films, commercials, or longer form, you have something to show and you can learn from it. Um, you know, a little bit of rewind talking about kind of the, the, the starting point, and this is where I, you know, I, I want everybody here that hasn't already, you know, Dallas's particular journey, which was, you, you know, if I understand it from our first conversation, you, you ended up kind of talking your way into being a, you know, a something, not because you were like trying to get into the entertainment industry, you're just done at a job. And then you saw your name on IMDb and it was like glowing or flashing or something like, oh, my goodness, like this is. You know, and then you took that and ran with it. And then everybody started taking you seriously, or at least we do. Um, and, you know, wa walk us through that, because I think that that story is so important to show that, you know, on one side, maybe it's fake it till you make it, which I'm completely cool with, you know, act as if. But you can do whatever you want to do if you put your mind to it. So uh, share with us more. Right. So uh, when I was when I just started as a contractor, I was transitioning uh, out of the military via National Guard, Georgia National Guard, and uh, was back and forth between Iraq and here. And I um, uh, was working for a nonprofit uh, group of about 80, 85, you know, kids that were in it, uh, teenagers. And uh, I was looking for uh, a filmmaker in the Dallas area, uh, which is where the core was from, uh, the drum core. And uh, I said, hey, you know, I'm looking for this. I want to do some promotional stuff for the group and everything. And, you know, he said, yeah, you know what? I'm actually doing a, you know, a zombie movie. So if uh, you can have your core members be extras in the for the ending of the film, then, you know, I'll, I'll cover whatever you need. You know, no worries. We'll just do a quid pro quo type of situation. And uh so I'm like, sure, whatever, that's cool. Um, so I organized it with him, and we got the core for two days uh, to go on set. Um, and there was something about being on set that was, I, I couldn't shake it. Uh, there was something about that that, I, that really just, uh, you know, kept me in, right? And then went through some personal stuff after that. Uh, I was still back and forth between Iraq uh, and here, and uh, it was, you know, what you said, uh, he had sent out an email, hey, you know, everyone's IMDb is up, we're good. I'm like, IMDb? I know that. That's where people go look at movie stuff. My name's on there? So I went there, and I, and I saw my name, I'm like, what? You know, because I was an associate producer, because, I, you know, we, we helped him with the big ending of their film. And uh, so I was like, interesting. And I just moved to Austin uh, to kind of reset and restart, you know, in life. Um, and... The apartment complex that I lived in, uh, the uh, one of the manager's boyfriends was a, a director, and uh, said, hey, you should connect with him or whatever. I'm like, okay, cool. So we connected and talked, and uh, we tried to determine what my place would be. Uh, he was doing a short film, and he wanted to incorporate me, and he said, well, based on kind of you know what I've heard about you now uh, and, and your military experience, it seems like you would make sense as a unit production manager. I was like, okay, that sounds about right. So uh, I was a UPM, you know, for his short film. And then through various uh, mixers and all that kind of stuff, I ended up UPM on another short film. And, you know, with a veteran population, you know, we learn quickly. Um, so I was able to learn a lot fast and decided that, you know what, I just want to start doing my own stuff. And so I started writing my own stuff, uh, directed a couple short films, and then, you know, thought I was ready to take the plunge into the feature world, which opened up a whole different can of worms um, that, you know, schooled me all over again. And uh, so that's about the time we started the company. And, uh, you know, I ended up, uh, we ended up writing a couple of high concept projects that, you know, it, the chicken or the egg, the industry, or the old industry problem, you know, you need money to do this, you need to do this to get money. So, where did that leave us, right? You know, in an industry that's hard to get above that glass ceiling, uh, we just had to do our own thing. So, you know, uh, my co-writer and I, also a veteran, uh, wrote a feature film that we could do now. Our CFO, Lacey, at Dream State, loved the script, decided to throw a little bit of money at it. Can you make this amount work? And after I stopped sweating, I said, I can try. And we made it work, and we did a feature film. Um, and... And now we're moving into the next thing. Uh, but it once I made that decision, you know, it was 
I, three years went by, and I, I looked back, and I was like, what happened? Time disappears. So, but yeah, that's kind of where it all originated from. It was literally because, you know, I was like, this is interesting. And now I've directed a feature film. I'm, I'm going, moving on to the next. I've got a wonderful team of people around me that, you know, that support every, everyone else as well. So it, it's, a, it's a family now, which is awesome. No, that makes sense. So tripped and fell into it, tripped and fell into it. What's your, what's your backstory? <laughs> Fought tooth and nail. Uh, <laughs> So I actually started acting when I was like five and doing theater. So I was a theater, musical theater kid, did the whole thing. I actually made a feature film length uh, movie before I even graduated high school. It was absolutely terrible. It was on VHS tapes. It was the original Avid system. And I didn't know at the time that you could, oh yeah, I'm old school. Um, So yeah. It's, you physically had to rewind the tapes. It was like making a mixtape, but an entire feature-length film. Um, so uh, I didn't realize it was something you could do for a living. Uh, so I did what n- a normal kid from a military family is. You join the military. So I got a scholarship, went to the University of Texas. Um, I looked at where the Navy had bases, and they had bases in Japan. So I was like, OK, I'll go learn Japanese. I went to Japan, uh, started working in the entertainment industry there. Um, and then came back, commissioned. The Navy sent me back to Japan. So I just called up my agents, and I'm like, I'll be here for two and a half more years. Like, let's let's get this. <laughs> so <laughs> during the day, I was at the Navy officer, engineer, and at night, I was working in the entertainment industry in Japan. I ended up hosting a TV show and uh, ended up producing it. Um, if you want to see me scream at Quentin Tarantino in Japanese, uh, just Google Quentin Tarantino commercial. And that was like the most I ever got done. paid in one day. It was done. And done. You, and done. you survived. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I actually, uh, the TV show that we were doing was called, uh, was on Fox International Channels. It was called uh, Back, Fox Backstage Pass. And we were interviewing American celebrities when they came to Japan. So I'd interview them in English and then speak to the camera in Japanese. Which ended up when I did my second tour in Virginia, which was terrible. Uh, I was like, I'm out. (laughs) I'm out. (laughs) Done. Um, Moved from active duty to reserve uh, and then moved to L.A. Like drove. I was in L.A. a week after I got out of active duty. Week later. Um, And started trying to work. um, Found out the hard way that if it wasn't in L.A., nobody cared. Except... TMZ. So my first real entertainment job was actually at TMZ because I'd already been working at a celebrity like news show. Um, And that was a very eye opening experience. But um, yeah, that was my first job. And it was fighting deuce to nail to find jobs that you could actually, you know, maintain a living in LA and actually get to do what you enjoy. That makes a lot of sense. One one, one thing for anybody that's that's uh, watching another takeaway there is while you're in the service, you were basically doing a side hustle. And that is something that I will say, outside looking in, I, I, it's, it, it's thrilling to see that happen a lot more often. It doesn't mean it's, I mean, I know it's hard. It's extremely hard. But being able to get a jump start on this, even if you decide, you know, turns yeah. out you hate entertainment, at yeah. least you figured that out, you know, a few years, but you end up loving it, so you end up putting yeah. uh, extra time under your belt. I will say that it's changed a lot uh, from when I was doing it, because then when I was, I was in the reserve still, I was still a reserve officer, and I wasn't in the entertainment industry, um, and then when I was active duty, it was a big no-no. Mm-hmm. They, I had to do the whole thing in secret. Um, when I got to L.A., I had changed my name because everybody knew me as Lieutenant Lunson. And so I went by Adrian Camille in the entertainment industry. So I had to keep the two worlds separate. And in the end, I had to give up one. And I ended up giving up the, my military uh, to follow that. The rules have changed a lot. Like I got in trouble just because I posted one time in my uniform on a, on my personal Instagram page. Mm -hmm. So I got in trouble for that. And then they did this big, uh, photo shoot where it was like the military person in regular clothes in the picture in the mirror yeah. with them in uniform. Um, I got a lot of online harassment from that. Um, and also Big Navy cared. Uh, now they don't care as much, especially for enlisted. So if you're going to start your Instagram channel, you're going to start your YouTube channel, you're going to start doing your thing, go for it because they're, they're not going to come after you anymore. 
But Which, keep an eye see, on Zero Blog Thirty because they will make sure and roast you when you put stupid crap out there. So, <laughs> um, you know, j- just because you have TikTok doesn't mean you should use TikTok. Agreed. <laughs> so true. What's my What's my story? Yeah, let's uh, let's let's dig in there a little bit. No, uh, I I had a fast paced career in the army. Um, did time with the 173rd Airborne during the surge back into Afghanistan. Um, and then uh, later on, my career took me to be assessed and selected to go to 75th Ranger Regiment, where I spent the rest of my career. I kind of hit a bro- brick wall. I was having uh, problems in life. We'll just keep it at that. Um, everything kind of came to a, to a head, and that was okay. Um, I had a good support net um, to get out. Uh, I just didn't know what was on the other side of the fence. And when I got out, it wasn't as green as I thought it was going to be. Um, when you're when you're that fast paced for so long, you still chase that adrenaline. Uh, for me, it was um, getting back into military training, um, whether it was police, um, first responders, military, anything from firearms to small unit tactics, stuff like that. And that's how I met him um, in Dallas as well, as we'd been doing training. I mean, to me, that had, had become my therapy. But getting into the film aspect of it. Um, I was looking at more of giving authenticity to the things that were being put on the screen. Um, a lot of the, the movies that we had seen and a lot of the projects that were coming out, Dallas had approached me. He's like, hey, I want you to help me out on this. And we pulled together our resources and grabbed a bunch of prior service guys to uh, basically go raid a hotel downtown Austin, which was pretty gnarly. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I kind of got sucked into it. I'm kind of the noob on this panel, I guess you could say. Um, but uh, it's pushed me in a different. It's pushed me in a different direction. You know, going through this whole process and, and this whole journey throughout film has driven me more to write. And I've had a, a big motivation from Dallas and, and Danny, especially, that we have all these experiences that we've been through throughout our career, multiple deployments, and for me, a lot of prolonged exposure. I didn't get a lot of rest in between. It was deploy, 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 train, train, deploy, deploy, deploy. And now I have time to kind of process those emotions and process those thoughts and process those memories and uh, put them down on paper. And I, I want to first off thank these two up here for pushing me in that direction to kind of get it out of your head and put it on paper. Um, seeing the film aspect of it and, and uh, being able to work with people, like we, when we get out of the military, we're always chasing that purpose and direction again. Uh, the, the military lingo for leadership is the ability to motivate by purpose, direction, and motivation while working to accomplish a mission or improve an ag- organization. And you're constantly looking to be that, that new leader or find that purpose and that find that direction again because that's what we had in the military. Being with these guys has just made my heart so full, and they're constantly motivating me to where now I'm, I'm kind of the soldier. Uh, I, I mean that, and uh, I'm learning from them throughout this journey, and I'm so humbled by it because uh, now it's pushing me in a direction to kind of put down all the things that I went through in my career. Not just me. There's so many of us out there that have been through traumatic experiences, but I'm, I'd encourage anybody, just write it down. Mm-hmm. Write it down. Because, I mean, you'll see later on this evening, we went from a shot list and an idea with me and you sitting around, and we put it on the big screen. And now, I mean, you guys are going to see that this evening. But that's... That's been my experience in film. It's been a great. It's been a great journey ever since. So, no, that's, that's awesome. And and one thing to, you know, when you talk about writing things down, I mean, a lot of obviously scripts originate from uh, from books or they originate from short stories. And um, I have a buddy of mine, and he uh, he was uh, he wrote about his experience when um, with all the time before and after the first battle of Fallujah. And what I thought was interesting when I read that, as I read all the you know all the superstar books about it, and they really get into more or less like the same exact story about the fighting in Fallujah before and after and around. And my buddy's entire book was, they wrote it from a point of view of how do they share the story with their grandkids' grandkids, which nobody cares about at that point what actually happened in the city. And it gets into the deeper, you know, emotional part of how odd it is to be, you know, checking corners and going from house to house. And there's, you know, random straight, one random stray dog, not the packs of them, that is all friendly and wants to play with you, and you're trying to stay in cover, and this silly dog wants to play with you. Like, 
those little things, and again, I can only share this from a civilian perspective and hearing the stories and hearing enough angles on it to at least attempt to try to get it across, but those, I believe, are the stories that when you put them on screen, that's where the emotion comes from. That's what's trying to be told. It's that second layer. So, um, you know, that's where, you know, you guys are the keepers of history, if you will, and that's a, that's a huge responsibility. I think, too, um, talking about uh, emotional struggles as well, like what we felt when we were overseas coming back and going through that transition and that assimilation is very important. You know, we like to put down on the big screen the, the glorified moments that look awesome, but, uh, you know, talking with Dallas and Danny and uh, a couple of my friends as well, Tom Satterley, um, Paul Martinez, guys from Mentors for Mill, you know, is talking about those emotions that we've actually experienced firsthand. That's been great for me. Is, is we, it's easy for us to re, re-portray that helplessness because we've been there, you know, that, that fear, that we've been through all that stuff. And it keying in on those emotions too um, has, has been has been awesome, um, and I think it's very important that we, we show that as well, that emotional attachment that happens, not only just when you're going through something bad overseas, but coming home to it, your relationship issues, all of it. I mean, we could go on and on and on, but uh, I think that's very important. Well, and to, to that point, not to inter- you know, interrupt you know, Danny here, but, um, or I, maybe I will, but... It's okay. You should be. Okay. <laughs> no, so... Uh, to go with what he's saying is, you know, one of the things that I think is important is capturing those emotions, yes, but, you know, one importance and one thing that we set out to do at Dream State was to have veterans do that, you know, because he just said it, and like, you know, we know those feelings, we know those emotions, we, you know, those little subtleties that come natural to us because we've been through it. Um, you know, actors are great. There are some strong actors out there that, that can pretty much do anything you ask them to do. You know, but it, it's coming from a, a place of authenticity with us, you know, that, you know, any veteran watching that is going to see it, recognize it. And what we want to happen in that moment is that they realize they get it. I, I understand. And we motivate them to do something, motivate them to tell their stories, you know, to start doing it. So in, in a way, what we've been doing has become a form of therapy for us. You know, and it's been extremely helpful. You know, and I, I know he and I have had conversations about this and, and you know, the difference that it's made in his life already. And you know, if we can keep doing that, then that's, that's ideal. So I'm going to jump on that, Dallas, because I think you bring up a really good point, which is being authentic from an actor's point of view. So, like, basically in my career aspect, I started working with a company over 10 years ago that was like a military consultant. And I literally fell into it because I was doing stunt work at that point and par- yeah. live, right? You like that? You see what I did there, guys? They're like, yeah. yeah, yeah. I right? <laughs> um, and my background in hand to hand combat, so they were like, hey, you'd be a really good fit. So they started like training me up in their, uh, their techniques and stuff. What I quickly began to realize when I was going on production is that filmmakers and writers never did their research, never actually sat down with like veterans about the story or actors not really sitting sitting down and really doing that research, even from the aspect of the mindset of what they went through, but the technicality aspect of weapon systems and how to change, like little things and everything, and how we as citizens have just accepted it and everything. So I made it a pledge not to be that actor and everything, because basically I just want to be like Jason Bourne um, and whatnot. <laughs> Who doesn't? So, I mean, yeah, seriously. Um, yeah, no, no, I do, and I did. I put in, like, hard, hard, like, I'm just going to fucking work with it, so I'm just going to curse. And so it's been really, for me, the journey has been really cool in my past, like, 10, 15 years is the stories that I've heard from these guys and everything and how they've been in a unique situation and for them to open up on that, too, and to the point where, like, what Ryan said, and he was telling me about his experiences, and I was like, bro, get it out of your head, and we're going to do this until finally I was like, all right, fuck it, screw it, we're doing it, and everything, just start writing it, I'm like, Dallas, we got to bring Dallas into it and everything. He was coming off his feature film and stuff too. So, and it just like, it was, personally for me, it was awesome because it was something working for something bigger. And that's very humbling. And I think in an industry where it's ego driven, I think it's important to do something that humbles you because it forces you to work that much harder. So I just want to say that. Yeah, absolutely. Throw it. Uh, uh, no, go, go. 
I just want to say, too, is just like this guy was out on the range every single day. You know, we wanted to do a training session. He wanted to learn how to shoot, move, and communicate. He was out there every single time um, putting in the work, putting in the effort, um, just as if he was one of us guys. And it's, that's been great to watch as well. We brought him out on some TAC med stuff, too. He got to do um, some medical training as well. And he's putting in the work, and that's been great to watch as well. Well, that's and it's completely appreciated. Um, th there is a disconnect in Hollywood. I will say because I'm not only on the entertainment side, but I'm also a veteran. And what happens in Hollywood uh, upsets a lot of veterans a lot of times because they they don't get the accuracy down. But it's also because they think they understand the military, but they don't really understand the military uh, because they've seen war movies. They think they understand war. And when I explain to them, I'm like, that's like watching hardcore porn and thinking you know good sex. Those are two very that is a great comparison. That is things. incredible comparison. Like just because you watched, you know. <laughs> I'm, you're welcome to use it, but it <laughs> it really is a total mis, uh, misconception of what's going on. And also, you have to understand some of these creative people, their whole lives they've been writers and they've been directors. And for you to come in and say, you don't understand what you're doing, is does is their ego. The ego yeah. Ban the ego. There's a way you go about it. So I was the tech advisor for the show Last Ship for season one for the writers. Um, and... You've got to remember when you go in there as a tech advisor, your name is tech advisor, not tech director. Like you can't, you can give them suggestions and because I was actually still uh, in the military at the time and uh, the show last ship was uh, sponsored by the military. There's ways you can get government sponsorship for movies through the either Army Liaison Office, the Navy Liaison Hollywood Office. So I was working for them at the time. Um, so they had to listen to me and things that they wanted to do if nobody hears Navy, but they wanted one time to have a, uh, a baseball diamond on the landing pad of the ship and use the, the ship's bell as home base, which if you know anything about the Navy, this, that's all sacrilege, total sacrilege and to get them to change those kinds of things. And so one, when you're talking to these creative people, it's, it's getting them one, their story and getting them to where they need to be. We also have a Hollywood, uh, we had a program where we would take writers and directors and producers and agents, and sometimes actors, to Navy ships. We would take them to Army bases where they actually get to see what's going on, talk to some people, and try to convince them that our opinions are very important and necessary. Uh, we also created a group called Veterans in Media and Entertainment. There's like 3,000 of us. Uh, we're in LA, DC and New York. So if you are a veteran in media, in entertainment, please look us up. Um, they've been around for five years. Uh, we had, like I said, 3,000 members and no suicides in a very, very uh, stressful industry and lonely city. So it's, it's huge and um, trying to band together. Um, one thing I will say about the veterans getting angry at the entertainment industry is that as an actor, Actors have a certain set of skills, while it is understanding the character and understanding, it's also technical. It's hitting your mark. It's not blinking. It's knowing your lines. It's being able to do the actor job, which is why many a times they will pick actors who pretend to be military over military, as they view, pretending to be actors. So if you are going to be in the entertainment industry, you have to also be a very technically good actor with this great background. Um, yeah. I actually have a point on that one. Since yeah. I don't have a background in acting, mm -hmm. um, I wasn't on the drama club, I didn't do any mm -hmm. of that, and it was like starting over all over again. Yeah. So, you know, after I left uh, the National Guard, I was a major. Um, my last job was the medevac company commander. So I was, uh, uh, and was also helping out with, um, the future pilots for the Texas National Guard, getting them put into flight school. So I went from being in this level where I was a commander mm -hmm. to, you know, I had some skills that were translating. Um, unfortunately, uh, Army Aviation isn't requiring them to memorize uh, their aircraft limitations and emergency procedures, but we used to have to have those down cold before you could even get near a helicopter. Mm -hmm. Rope memorization, those are your lines. Just say your lines. So some of those things translated, but I had to go back to square one. I 
literally would just throw myself into these commercial auditions and make a complete ass of myself. You know, I'd be like, sure, whatever. But, you know, with the therapy side of this, you know, finding the authenticity, especially those of us who have some trauma that stays with us, we have to work through that. It takes a lot of work. There's different types of acting classes you can take that really help facilitate moving that through your body. And it is a, it's a constant process for me. It's a daily thing for me still. Meisner. I, I Just saying, I, I, Dallas knows this. I absolutely love Meisner. I love so Meisner. It, it was one of the best things for me uh, when I studied it. So I studied, I, I've studied Meisner. I've studied improv. Um, I've studied some other really great things. But Meisner in particular was a huge turning point for me. And it wasn't even so much about what you gain out of Meisner itself as what you take home and process afterwards. And it literally is, it's time for me to go back to therapy right now. You it's know? a lot of trauma. It, it's a, a lot, lot of trauma that goes a, into it. Oh, no. There was a time, and I'm, I'm just going to tell this story. When I was in a Meisner class with an Army Ranger, former Army Ranger, and we got into a screaming, <laughs> screaming fight with each other profanities. I mean, we were in each other's faces. I mean, you thought we were going to start swinging at each other. And at one point, I just looked at him and I go, you're relieved. And he starts laughing. And he's like, I'm relieved. <laughs> <laughs> and our instructor just kind of sitting there like, what the, you know, it, it was it was a big moment for all of us. I mean, it was, um, you know, and of course, I then also proceeded to get my butt chewed by our instructor because she's amazing, and that's what she does is just continue to break you down. But it, um, it in itself, the you have to do the work. It's not just I was in the army. I know how to handle a rifle. I can you know shoot, move, and communicate. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to go. I mean, there is a lot that you have to go back, go back to the beginning. You know be a private again, be a cadet, be whatever you want to call yourself. But, you know, that humility is there. I'm constantly learning. And, but it, it's been such a huge thing. You know, if I were to think about where I was five years ago versus where I am today, and I will say Meisner was a huge part of that. There's an amazing instructor here in Austin and highly, highly recommend her. Um, she'll put you in the moment. I'll give you that. Well, so. <laughs> All men should do Meisner because it teaches you to listen. Well, the thing is, like, so. <laughs> That's very true. One thing, one thing that I want to speak to about uh, for, for Ryan back there is, you know, in, in, and I agree with both of you. I mean, a lot of it does. Um, you know, and I, I'm not an actor. I'm a director. But, you know, the thing is, I know how to communicate. You know, I know how to communicate to, um, you know, to my actors, right? With me being in that position that I'm in, understanding, you know, those elements of, you know, of, of authenticity and accuracy, what is, what isn't, I have an ability to communicate to him. He, you'll see it in the journey when you see the short film tonight. He's a natural at it, but it, it took me knowing how to communicate to him for all that to make sense. If I, I and, and I will say that if if a uh, uh, you know, not not this is not a, a slam at all, but a, a director that's not a veteran would not understand how to communicate effectively, and he would probably that they would b go back to square one, and he would be right back down to the bottom again, like I don't know what I'm doing, you know, I, I don't know what you're telling me right now, and and there would be this this conflict. So that's it's one thing that I've been able to really effectively uh, to do with the the veterans I've had on camera is communicate. Well, I'd, I'd say there when you look at a lot of uh, the you know the bigger blockbuster films, and that's kind of what we've talked about. I mean, we can give a lot of credit to the the Mark Wahlbergs and the Keanu Reeves and those types for the the amount of effort they put in, but they end up with a lot of the same um, the same consultants that follow them around, or it's the same you know it's the same directors you keep seeing in all these movies. Um, otherwise, you don't end up with you know what in the 1917 that just came out, and he's just incredible looks at it. And I think that's just a really uh, interesting byproduct of how, you know, yes, we've been in the Middle East in this current way for almost 20 years, and you have a lot of a lot of talent coming out. You have a lot of diversity, and what ends up happening goes into film and storytelling. Um, you know, beyond the film, you've got mocap for all of your, you know, video games or any of the digital stuff. That's a whole nother area. And you talk about communicating. That's not lines at the moment. That's like 
the most precise things because you can't make any mistake because you've got the little you know sticky things all over you and it's going to capture it within your you know your skeleton so um you know that that sort of thing's really important to look at um wanted to look at a, a couple other areas here right so when somebody's listening you know within our audience we're kind of we're trying to tell them why should they look at this or not look at it for that matter uh, getting into film and entertainment um i know what four of four of y'all are in the austin area you're from L.A., correct? Okay. So when you look at film, we've got a few hot spots. You've obviously got you know New or film entertainment. You've got New York. You've got L.A. You've got the little engine that could, which is Austin. And then depending upon you know, different state tax cuts, George is known for film. What you know? What sorts of commentary would you have about where should you be to get started? Like where do where do you go if you're in Austin or if you're in Iowa, like what, what is, what does that pathway look like? Um, you need to start wherever you are. There are opportunities wherever you are. There is community theater. There is also, um, a lot of online. So there's actorsaccess.com, which does list jobs for auditions. Um, there's also LA casting, which does have uh, castings specifically for actors around. There's Production Hub. Um, also, all of the film commissions also have their own resource page and their own uh, job listings pages, uh, which have all the production companies. So if you're like, hey, I was a combat camera person, go do this. Uh, like, consider me for your next behind the scenes or to come out or whatever you want to do. Um, there's also TV channels that are all here. Um, and try something there. But first find out if you like the entertainment industry before you move anywhere. If you don't like doing theater because it's too much work, maybe look at a different part of the industry. If you don't like waking up at four o'clock in the morning or if you don't like standing outside with a heavy camera for several hours, ugh, maybe look at something else in the entertainment industry. So just make sure you like it first before you move to LA or move to New York or somewhere else. Right, and you know, you know, being from the you know city where it's the little city that could, you know, there's, you know, Austin has a lot of its own, uh, things it's dealing with in the entertainment industry and, you know, uh, low tax incentives, you know, not a lot of big productions coming here to Texas anymore. Um, you know, uh, a club mentality that's really hard to kind of get into is not as open. Of course, that's expanded in L.A. You have a bigger club mentality that's harder, to, even harder to get into. So you, you do kind of have to have and take some initiative and start on your own. But one thing that I, you know, we went to AFM back in November, and, you know, that, the question gets, what's that? Oh, yeah, AFM is the uh, American film market, um, and uh, it's where a lot of independent filmmakers will go and try to sell their films. Uh, there's lots of panels, lots of things that, get, that happen during that period of time. A lot of connections are made, um, and one thing that we heard over and over and over again when a similar question was asked, you know, is, you know, you got to do this, you got to start on your own, you can do this on your own. It's like, but the problem is, is it's such a, an isolating answer that, you know, because I, I feel like the, the industry as a whole is so scared of opening up to anybody. Um, so what we're doing now is we're, we're, we're doing, we're taking different approaches. You know, we're, you know, we're in a time right now where you can't start to challenge that mindset. And, you know, you can start breaking through that protective barrier by opening up. And, you know, we've seen great success. I mean, yeah, uh, the feature film that we finished, uh, Hyde, you know, has a lot of unfamiliar faces and actors in it, right? You know, no, nobody that's going to put butts in theater. But if you sit down and watch the movie, you're not going to know any different. That you're, you're not looking at somebody you don't know because it's quality. And that, you know, but we took it upon ourselves to do that because nobody's going to, no, nobody in that cl isolated clubhouse is going to do that for you, right? So, but find, also find companies like us, like Dream State, that are open. We, we do want to work with you. We do want to bring you in. If you're, especially if you're a veteran, that's one of our missions, you know, is like, come see us, come talk to us. We're not, we love ideas. We love new ideas. We're not trying to hold on to everything and, and protect everything, Uh Come see us. You know, we're we're trying to shake things up, and that's what we're doing. 
And when it, and again, I was going to say, when it comes to just making film, right now the barrier to entry financially continues to get lower. It's not cheap, but the reality is you can go and get a decent camera set up. It's why everybody's, uh, you know, their own documentary every single day with their, their the vlogging stuff. Yeah. Um, but that same equipment, you could go and, you know, for some sort of consumer product group that's a lifestyle brand, shoot a solid commercial. Now there's obviously pieces to it, and you put together your storyboards and your arc, and then you need editors, but it's still pretty gosh darn low. But it's how do you get those different people together that are all being told yeah. that you need to do it on your own? Uh, well, a few things on that is once you finish this, if you want to get eyes on some of these projects that are high quality, but maybe not theater, is film festivals. Film festivals are a great way to go and meet people. Like I was coming all the way to South By to meet filmmakers who were part of this process uh, because you always need your network. It's, it is who you know, but it's also who your friends are because your friends hire your friends and that keeps it going. So go to film festivals, you can meet people there. Um, my company, um, so two years ago, I left to start my own production company, and it was, there's so much paperwork, so much organization that goes in with it, that I created a software called Clio Studio. It's taken me two years. We came to launch at South By to allow you to produce a project and all the technical stuff behind it that they don't even really teach at film school. So I can talk about that later, but let's, we can keep doing on this. But yeah, find your friends, get together. There's Facebook groups. There's the Veteran Entertainment Group. There's the resources on your uh, film commissions. There's a lot of stuff out there. You just got to look for it. No. No. <laughs> well, and, it, and all this stuff, again, it takes work. And, it, I, you know, and it's one of these themes that I find when we're talking about anything that has to do with employment, jobs, production. It's, you know, you got to take personal responsibility, personal accountability, personal awareness, situate all those different, uh, you know, states of being that I think really resonate with the military community, uh, which I, which I believe is huge. Um, yeah, I know we're getting, we got, you know, about 10 minutes or so to go. So it's going to just have a little bit of fun. Um, my curiosity is, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, yeah, yeah, like I'm having fun. Now get weird. I'm yeah, you want to get weird. That's what you're saying. Yeah, okay, let's get weird. Um, let's do it. There's a lot of military film. Everybody's got their opinions on military movies and films. What's the best? What's the worst? And why? Um, we don't have to get super into detail, but I'd like to start the worst. What's the what's the worst? Let's call it the last twenty years, or you know things. Like that. What is the worst military movie? Not allowed to have the mic. Yeah. But we should. Here you go. go, ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. Well, now I want to know. Like, yeah, yeah, we all want to know. So I'm gonna start with Ryan. This had a mature rating before it came on. <laughs> okay. We'll go around the panel and then, then I'll, I'll see how it <laughs> How about this, Dallas? You start this one. No, do it, do it. Worst. Because I th um, yes. Well, okay, the last 20 years specifically. Um, man, I see, here's the thing. I, 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 I can't take the two hours to watch something that I know is going to be bad. So I think that's my answer because I haven't seen a bad one because I won't watch a bad one. What, what do you then see that you're like? You the know, trailer. Not, oh, so what is it? What trailer did you see? You're like, hell no. All of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was three. Like, everybody likes to throw, you know, everybody. What was one you liked? then? Well, I mean, to, to sub well, subvert your question, uh, I, you know, it's a little over 20 years now, I think now, but um, I, I my, my, my go-to default 100% is Black Hawk Down uh, is the best military film that's been made, uh, and that's largely because Ridley Scott took the time to put his actors with actual rangers and actual operators to go through legit training and use actual rangers. Uh, when, when fast roping, when doing a lot of the, the, bigger, the bigger wide scenes, you know, uh, and he leaned heavily on his advisors and let them pretty much run the show. Um, and uh, next to that, I, I would have to give a shout out to Warriors Inc. for their job they did in Saving Private Ryan, which is I know even further than 20 years ago. But it, it's just you know uh, the opening scene when when it makes World War II veterans uncomfortable enough they have to leave. You know, of course that's not meant to be funny. That's just a testament to how accurate. And, and attention to detail that was, you know, and then, you know, we were soldiers is another one for me. Yeah. So, so that was awesome. So I'm also going to say Apocalypse Now is one of my favorite films too. On the same time, because I think it's incredible for 
capturing a moment in time that was so transitional in the world on the same time from the music from the acting from the soundtrack and then another one for me that i really enjoyed was 13 hours i really enjoyed that even though i'll give credit michael bay did it good i was like i was kind of a little little scared shitless about if he was gonna like fuck it up and everything but i didn't well true uh, I would have to say I'm a. <laughs> We've changed it to movies. Yeah, you're like. saying. Like movies. Well, no, movies no, no, like. no, 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 no. Uh, we're we're so pushing the rewind button. I want to know. <laughs> so, <laughs> how to get a fre- fresh breath here. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I'm, Mean Girls isn't that bad. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. No, that's uh, actually good. It's better than what you did. I feel sorry for my my mom and dad that had to put up with me watching Black Hawk Down over and over and over again. Um, it's one of the big driving forces for me to want to come in the military at the time and eventually become a ranger. You know, when I watched that movie, um, granted, it was a horrible incident that happened in 1993 and uh, we lost a lot of good people. And now I have some relationships with those guys that are survivors now. Um, but uh, growing up watching Black Hawk Down, Saving Private Ryan, Band of Brothers, but uh, Black Hawk Down stood out to me and I knew um, at the time. You know, that's if I'm going to do something, that's what I want to do. Um, Saving Private Ryan, at first, when it first came out, my parents are, are very conservative, very Christian. And they're like, you're not, you can't watch R rated movies, you know, whatever. But uh, it was uh, at that point in time when Saving Private Ryan came out, it was, it was very realistic. You know, even my dad wouldn't want to watch it. And uh, he's prior service as well. Um, Band of Brothers, I remember being overseas. You remember being overseas watching the whole entire series. You'd get together with everybody in the hooch and watch the entire series. Um, but those are the ones that stick out to me. Yeah, I, that, I was actually. I, I kind of I I, like, I feel like we did. There was, did. I was, I was something you missed in that higher. I had Band of Brothers and, and Saving Private Ryan, yeah. and al- Saving Private yeah. Ryan along with the others. And, you know, um, you know and I was in the 101st. So I had a really big thing with with that, with Abe on your shoulder. Uh, and when I did recruiting, I often talked about Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers as the reference. You know, that was the commonality where the kids could, you know, be like, oh, yeah, 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 I have seen that movie. Um, additionally, with those, um, you know, while I was in ROTC in college, I, I'm going to have to go there, guys. Full Metal Jacket and Platoon. There's nothing wrong with that. That's they good. Were, they it's were good. good. I love Gunny. I love Gunny. Um, those were very, those were very pivotal in Heartbreak Ridge. Yeah. yeah. You know. Did you guys ever see Wind Talkers? Not yet. You know what that is? Did you guys like that? There we go. I was, I was trying to think of one, but I love Nicolas Cage. So, and that's a totally different discussion to have. Stop. I'm, gonna I, I'm not going to. No, I'm saying I'm, I'm being. I'm going to be good. So I'm going to go even farther back because my dad uh, brought me up on Bat Twenty One and Uncommon Valor. Those were some good military Absolutely. movies. Uh, yeah, I'll go. I'll go old school. Okay. But uh, those were some good movies too. Okay, down Periscope. <laughs> <laughs> What's next in the army? Actually, now? in the army no. now. <laughs> Let's down, just go with that. That I think periscope. that's it. That's no, our no. threshold. Down Periscope actually got like being like the the comedy that happens in like why is the lord next to the coffee i have seen that kind of argument happen on the ships so in navy life that insanity when you're locked together happens um master and commander even though it's very old for a, a different time period and then uh uh operation petticoat i was gonna so. do uh, private benjamin Oh, Private Benjamin. Oh, That's we're going to do that. I'm going with yeah. Patriot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we went way back. I had to throw so the Navy in there. Served, but that's Go why Navy. I said 20 years. It's funny. Look what you uh, did. Look at the can of worms you opened. In the past 20, 20 years, and I, I didn't necessarily expect anybody to say, you know, American Sniper or anything like that at that list because um, there's a lot of just kind of oddities in it, like fake babies. But um, Yeah, none know, of us said that. That's yeah. it. Yeah. But, the, yeah. but even with that one, I think that it, where a lot of people gave some credit is you start to get into the emotional side. And it was... It, that was the f- you know one of the first times to really at least attempt to while not going way overboard, which some of the older ones I think did a really great job at it. Um, I just watched the uh, the Catch Twenty Two series that was on Hulu. I thought that did a really again for what anybody can understand with that being a World War Two flick, but it did a really good job um, in the same way that uh, George Clooney's put together some weird movies like Men Who Stare at Goats and whatnot. It's 
kind of in that look and feel, but it really digs into the emotion of it um, almost in you know a, a, a full metal jacket type way. So that's cool. Um, yeah, Three Kings. Three Kings seems really oh, relevant for you know. 91 era. Um, Hurt Locker. That must be everybody's. Th that's the one that comes up all the time. I want to know why. So we got three. We got about two and a half minutes left. That and that's gonna, like, that's let's not end it on Hurt Locker. Okay, we're not going to do, we're not gonna do <laughs> that. Well, I still want to know what he doesn't like, yeah. and everybody else wants to say it. Reserve that for the campfire site. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, um, well, let, you know, we are running out of time. So, um, real quick opportunity for everybody, you know, 30, 40 seconds. Uh, where can somebody find you? What's a project you're working on? I know three of you are for sure working on the same project, but what, what do you want to make sure um, everybody knows uh, that you've got going on? Um, Adrian Camille Lunson, once again, you can find me either, a lot of stuff is still under Adrian Camille, uh, but Lunson, L-U-N-S-O-N, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, um, and I do have a YouTube channel, but it's mainly for Clio Studio, K-L-I-S-T-U-D-I-O, which is my new software. If you do follow us, we will be putting up tutorials on very specific things like how to break down a script, how to budget for um, your upcoming short film, what is insurance, what do you need, and be very specific on the industry-specific things you need in order to make your first project if you want to do that. So please do follow us, and it's Clio Studio on Instagram, LinkedIn, whole nine yards so of which we're about to become customers of because that's what she's doing with uh, that software program is is going to be amazing so highly recommend going there uh, if your filmmakers watching this pay attention uh, you can find me on uh, all of the uh, socials uh, I'm never really on Twitter because I still don't really fully understand it um, or have the time, but uh, it's uh, Dallas Burgess. Uh, you can find me at all the stuff. Uh, Dream State uh, Entertainment is on Facebook as Dream State Immersive, uh, as is on Instagram. Uh, what we have going on, uh, we just finished, you know, at least the um, uh, premiere-worthy version of the journey that's going to go into some further expansion uh, in the near future in its own time. Uh, currently, we are uh, in development for a feature film science fiction thriller called The Demeter, and currently exploring some things with Alamo Drafthouse with <clears throat> our uh, feature film Hyde, uh, doing a Hyde immersive thing. So we're also exploring some immersive, both uh, with XR and live action immersive uh, theater. So that is uh, what we got going on. So you can find us all over. Uh, and I'm Elizabeth Joy. It's Elizabeth with an S, not a Z. It's the German spelling, just to clear that up. Uh, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, Elizabeth Joy, uh, my handle is uh, underscored between the two words, Elizabeth underscore Joy underscore ATX. And I'm with Calidus Agency. I have a couple of film projects um, that I'm not completely privy to mention yet, but hopefully we'll be shooting soon. And... Um, I'm also uh, doing a lot of dance work and I'm working with the Austin Veteran Arts Festival. I'm the dance director for that, where we're promoting healing veterans through the arts and preventing veteran suicide. <coughs> and you can find me there at www.avafest.org. My turn. Yeah, you, guys, uh, you, you can guys, find you me on Instagram, uh, red3 underscore one alpha, or you can go to uh, my training page, which is dino at 911 TACMED. Unfortunately, we didn't have Matt here today. He's out saving the world, so make sure you go follow Matt Kinney, Matt at 911 TACMED, and the official page 911 TACMED uh, for any of your training needs. Um, wish he was here. We just want to say hi, Matt, if you're listening. Um, also, too, is, is uh, we'll be doing some projects with uh, Dallas and Danny as we continue the journey um, as, it, as it goes. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. If you need to catch me up on Instagram, I'm not on Facebook. I don't do Twitter, and I don't do Snapchat. I'm kind of dedicated to one social media thing it makes my brain not explode consistently throughout the day um but yeah that's where i'll be cool all right i'll make it quick so dallas pretty much said everything about dream state i'm danny august mason you can find me on facebook by that name i'm uh, mostly on instagram danny mason 10 uh between that also matt be safe out there saving the world uh between that uh getting excited going to pre-production for a actual world war ii film and stuff. I'll be playing at SAS Soldier, so I'm very excited about that and whatnot, and we're excited also about where this collaboration with Dallas and Ryan goes, so 
Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, looks like we're going to be taking a break for a bit, and we'll be back on with the Innovative Immersion panel at 4.15 Central Time. Yep. Thanks, Ash. Thank you. Yep. Thanks again.